um good morning good afternoon good evening depending on the time where you'll be watching this kamalami montando sindane and i'm going to be today leading the discussion on uh, free education decommodification and decolonizing the curriculum first i want to thank the leadership of the eff students command uh, President Manja Squambani and his collective for asking me to lead week five of uh, the Students' Command political discussions. Now, uh, comrades and friends, before I begin the discussion with you, uh, I thought I should share five plus one books. The books that I'm going to show to you are books that uh, got me through my years as a student activist and indeed as a <clears throat> youth activist. Now, you must read these books uh, for you to be able to articulate your struggle as a student leader, but also to think sharply about other issues that affect our society. Now, without wasting any time, in no particular order, uh, it's five plus one. Five, I think, are compulsory, and one is optional. <clears throat> The first one is Freedom in Our Lifetime. Uh, it's a collection of writings and speeches and a part of his master's uh, degree, Anton Lembert. Number two, one of South Africa's foremost intellectuals. The name of the book is Native Life in South Africa by Sol Blanc. Number three, a personal favorite, The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Number four, I write what I like, selected writings and speeches by Steve Biko. And lastly, number five, uh, Black Skin, White Masks, Franz Fanon. Now, these are compulsory. I think if you're a student leader and you've not read these five, you are joking. Now, the optional one is this one. Uh, Capital Volume 1, Karl Marx, or as others call it, Das Kapital. Now, there are other versions, you know. The hardcover is thicker, is bigger. Don't let that intimidate you because there are some publishers who write... A thinner copy. Now, comrades and friends, I promise not to take more than 30 minutes for this discussion. And as I go, I'll be mentioning names of scholars and activists who have either written substantively about this or whom I gain my own articulation from. When I name them, uh, comrades and friends, don't think of me as somebody who's name dropping. I'm not name dropping. I'm doing so so that so that as you listen, you write the names down, you search them, you read further, and you grapple with these ideas with much more depth. Now, the discussion of what we have, comrades and friends, is threefold: free education, decommodification, and decolonization of the curriculum. And I'm going to start with the latter, which is decolonization of the curriculum or decoloniality generally. <clears throat> now, on the meaning of decoloniality, I want to start with what uh, Sylvia Winter, uh, Boventura de Dos Santos, and Fanon explain as the Abisa line. Uh, the explanation, comrades and friends, begins with a lie or something that says the world as we know it today is divided by a line. And this line is called an abyssal line. And on one side of the line you find what we call the zone of being. And on the other, you find what we call the zone of non-being. Now, I know um, 
through social media conversations, Professor Tsepo Malingozi says we must retire these two terms, but let, let us use them for now. Now, I've drawn, I've made it for you. So this line that you see here is the Abisa line. Assume that this piece of paper is the world. Well, the world is round, but you know what I mean. And this line here is the Abisa line. And on this side, you find the zone of being. And on this side, you find the zone of non-being. Now, in decolonial articulation, in the zone of being, you find white humans. And in the zone of non-being, you find a black hole called Abantawa Nyam. Now, Sabana Ndiovuka Jenny tells us that once upon a time in this world, we were all a happy family of human beings. Then the whites removed black people from being beings or being humans. Right? Now, when they removed us from being humans, they then made us to become subhumans and they remained humans. So they reside in the zone of being and we reside in the zone of non-being. Now, what makes the zone of being and the zone of non-being different? Now, when you say black people are non-beings or you've removed their humanity from them, you make them reside physically in areas that are not palatable for human uh, residents. You make them reside in... Uh, 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 you, you basically keep them in inhumane conditions and that is basically the zone of non-being. Now... At an epistemic level, or at, an, at a level of knowledge, you do precisely the same thing, where you have scholarship, and scholarship is white, and that is the zone of being. And then you have myth, voodoo, superstition, that is the zone of non-being because it is black. Now. What else do you find in the zone of being? In the zone of being, you find whiteness, you find Marx, you find Hege Hegelian thought, Sigmund Freud, Adam Smith, John Maynard Keynes, you can mention them. All of these are considered to be knowledge. And then what do you find in the zone of non-being? Like I said, a black hole called and rhinos and dogs and cats. Now, I put rhinos and dogs and cats for the next part of the discussion. The point of decolonization is to remove the abyssal line. Right? So when we are saying we want to decolonize, we are not saying black people want to move from here to here. No, no, no. Decolonization is removing the abyssal line. But these colleagues or these friends of ours, white people, don't want to remove the abyssal line. They want the abyssal line to remain intact. Instead, what they are doing is to fight to bring over a few amongst us to this zone, right? Most vehemently, what they are not shameful about is to fight for rhinos and dogs. For instance, in, in, let me just make this example. In the world that we are living in, or in this South Africa that we are living in, you kill one rhino you'll find yourself serving many years in jail. I mean, there are initiatives, there's money spent to save the rhino. Right now, we're on lockdown, 
right? Uh, go on Google. You will find uh, uh, something called the Association of Dog Walkers. Professional Association <clears throat> of Dog Walkers or Professional Pet Sitters. These are essentially white organizations fighting to humanize lions, I mean rhinos, humanize dogs and cats and their pets. But no, blacks must remain in the zone of non-being. Now, there are three localities, and many scholars write about this, but one, one that comes immediately to my head is uh, Ramon Crossfugel. Three localities of coloniality. But before I get into that, I must maybe define coloniality vis a vis colonialism. Because decolonization, remember we said decolonization is wanting to remove this abyssal line. Decolonization is a response to coloniality and not colonialism. Now, Professor Nelson Maldonado Torres does something very beautiful to define the difference between colonialism and coloniality. Colonialism marks what ended in 1961, British colonialism in South Africa, and um, uh, 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 1994, apartheid colonialism. That is a period that legally ends. But coloniality is the vestigial power, the legacy, the remnants, what remains today of the colonial order. So coloniality, where coloniality, colonialism is gone, coloniality is what we experience today. Now, Grossfugel even goes further from the, dif from the differentiation that is made by Torres. He says colonia colo coloniality and modernity are the are two sides of the same coin, right? He says modernity is how the rest of the world, the westernized world, conceives social change, democracy, uh, 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 and scientific disciplines, right? But the subaltern or the colonized uh, uh, um, use coloniality to articulate the same experience. So us who are colonized don't, don't experience modernity the same way as the rest of the world. Our articulation of modernity is essentially deeply imbued in coloniality. Now there are three localities of coloniality. One, coloniality of being. Two, coloniality of knowledge. And three, coloniality of power. Now, being is the most important one. And this is me who's saying, all, of, all three are important, but I am saying being is the most important one. And being is explained by Nelson Maldonado Torres using René Descartes. René Descartes has a philosophy that says, I think, therefore I am. Right? I think, therefore I am. So, Torres explains to us that the colonizer use, used this ontological axiom to say white people or Europeans are beings or they are precisely because they think and they invest it that's the colonizer and they then said black people cannot think therefore they are not so that is coloniality of being of course other people have explained it differently and there are many there are various ways because the colonial experience renews and reshapes itself over the years for instance Professor Mogobe Bernard Ramos doesn't really argue with the Descartes uh, formulation, but he says that Aristotle, Plato, and uh, Socrates 
had many conversations and debates among themselves throughout the span of their lives. And two, two things, amongst others, emerge from those debates. One, man is inherently a political animal. Two, man is inherently a rational being. Now, Professor Ramosa then says, the latter one, which says man is a rational being, was then used, right, to say we Europeans are rational beings, but Africans are not rational beings. Now, these are two ways where the being of Africans are colonized. Why was it important for the colonizer to make these expansive arguments? Because the colonizer realized that you can't subjugate a human being. Before you subjugate or you colonize a human being, you need to dehumanize him. You need to other him. He must be the other. You must uh, must make him a thing. You must thingify. I think Professor Lovukajen uses that one a lot. Or Anipal Kuyan and Walter Mignolo. He must thingify. He must make them things. So black people then became things. Became objects. They became the non-being. Right? So that is the coloniality of being, which exists today. I, I, I made an example of dogs and rhinos. 32 black South African workers were killed in 2012. There was an uproar for a few minutes and it died down. Right? And Resta Tane was killed. Uh, of close to 300 mentally ill patients in life estimate two or three years ago were killed for profit. There was also an uproar, but were forgotten. Now, Julius Malema says this a lot. Kill just a white hobo in Marshalltown, Johannesburg. Just one white hobo. The rent will plummet. There will be sanctions. You know, the, the whole world will remember. That's precisely because the black body, and I know Prof. Malingos also doesn't like black body, but we'll use it. The black body today, in this democratic South Africa, in this modern world, is still a non-being. Now, I'll just touch briefly on knowledge. Coloniality of knowledge, use the same no uh, logic on coloniality of knowledge and coloniality of power. Coloniality of knowledge brings in, or wants, wants us to question knowledge. How is knowledge created? Who creates this knowledge? For what purpose is this knowledge being created? Um, in, in, in decolonial studies, Ndavuka Jane also touches heavily on this to say, the knowledges that have been created post the colonial period serve not to liberate the black community or the subaltern or the other or the zombies of the world, but it serves to further entrench or to deepen their <clears throat> um, situation. That is coloniality of knowledge. Coloniality of power speaks to institutions of power in the world. How these institutions post-democracy continue to entrench the abyssal line. Think of, for instance, uh, our South African courts. You know, how South African courts or how South African legal system protects heavily property rights. You know, who owns property post-1994? It's white people, you know. But when it comes to a, a social economic justice, when it comes to social justice, Institutions of power such as the court, such as parliament, uh, continue to entrench uh, our colonial reality. Uh, globally, the, the, the same is, this, this question is the same. 
because look at IMF, for instance, and the World Bank over the past 10 to 30 years. Who are they funding? For what purpose are they funding? And what do they do uh, post their funding? I'm rushing comrades and friends. Uh, now, uh, Professor Samuel Ndofukajen assists us to point out it's not really like the Communist Manifesto to point out the tasks of decolonization. Remember at, at first I said um, we were once a happy family and then we were othered, we were dismembered. So broadly, he paraphrases Anibal Cuyano and Enrique Diocel and Walter Mignolo to say, and also he borrowed a bit also from Ngugi Wationgo to say, to decolonize, therefore, is to remember the black body that was dismembered, right? So, I said uh, decolonization is not about the non being moving to this side, but it's about removing this line. Because we want to remember, we don't want to keep immediately that exists. So remember that, or recall that decolonization means to remember the dismembered. Good. Now, he guides us, he gives us 13 days, the 13 days of decolonization. And I won't comment on all of them for the sake of time. One, is depatriarchalization. Hmm? Patriarch, no, number one. Two, deep bourgeoisification. That's number two. Three, detribalization. Your uncle lent to a mumkoni mkoni must come to an end. <laughs> Four, deimperialization, the fight against imperialism. Five, which is, I mean, uh, six rather. I wrote a book on this. Deprovincialization, Sabalan from Fukajen, 2019. Number seven, deperipherization, moving those who are in the periphery to the center and destroying the periphery. Number eight, demystification. Number nine, decommodification, which we're going to discuss shortly. Number 10, decommissioning. Number 11, democratization. Number 12, deborderization. And this is, an, this is the agenda of the EFF, deborderization, removing borders everywhere where there is. Not just the physical borders, but also epistemic borders. 13, deracialization. So those are the 13 Ds of decoloniality. Now, comrades, I will quickly say two or three things about free education and decommodification. Now, on decommodification, uh, I won't waste much time, but go to the discussion that was led by uh, Comrade, I mean, Commissar Ndlozi, uh, when he explains how Karl Marx explained what a commodity is. Now, when the Fizz Must Fall generation was saying, education must be decommodified. What they, or what we, because I was part of them, <laughs> what we meant is education must not be something that is sold. It must not be a commodity. Because a commodity is something that you package and you sell for profit. Now, the generation of Fismas Fall students studied this question and they said to each other that in fact we can't have a situation where something that is so important for societal growth and development falls within capitalist reasoning and logic which is profit because currently and, and, and I, I'm, an, I'm an emerging researcher and academic I hate saying this but it's, it's the truth currently what you have Institutions of higher learning are, are not different from supermarkets because institutions of higher learning sell education. So when you are there, 
you are not there to learn, you are not there to grow, you are not there to be educated in the true sense of the word, but you are actually there to buy a piece of paper, which is a degree or a diploma or a certificate, whatever the case may be. Now, decommodification, therefore, has to do with removing the profit aspect of education. Now, the last point, and I'm going to close on this one, free education. You know, my, my friend and comrade, comrade Mpom Rulan, was the inaugural president of the uh, EFF Students' Command. And during FISMA's fall, he made a proposal that, uh, I mean, we're protesting, so government had to listen. That um, they, they asked him, how are we going to fund this free education? And he said, there should be a, a, a tax, you know, there should be a special tax for education. And uh, of course, it was not a sellout position, it was our position, we had discussed it. But with the benefit of time and the benefit of hindsight, we now know that that was a very short-sighted position. That was an opportunistic position. And, and given the, the politics of the day, we had to say something, right? But now when we sit and discuss this, we realize that there can never be anything called free education in a capitalist society. Because in a capitalist society, education is inherently a commodity. Which then means that for us to achieve free education, we must first attain socialism in our lifetime. Now, uh, Comrade Kumani, the National Senior Researcher of the EFF, discussed uh, Lenin, but briefly gives us six steps to get to a sociali socialism that we're looking for. One, the working class must be conscious of itself as a class. Two, based on this consciousness, the working class must organize itself. Three, the working class must capture the state. Four, the working class must smash the state. Five, the working class must set up or build a new state and this state shall be a state under the express rule of the working class, which others call, or which in classic Marxist literature is called the dictatorship of the proletariat. And then the last stage is the state will begin to wither away. And that is what we know as a communist society. But stage five is what is important. The state under the rulership of the working class. Now, this state is going to, amongst others, the difference between the, the, this state and the capitalist state is that this state is going to focus on the socialization of the means of production, assets that create wealth, your mines, your transport, your bank, and other strategic sectors of the economy. When you nationalize these, you are able to use the proceeds or the wealth that comes from these assets to fund free healthcare, to fund free transport, and, and to fund free education. Now, there are no shortcuts to some of these things because Having stay, uh, education tax as we were coining it with Comrade Limpour back then might work here and now, but inherently, inherently, it's unworkable because uh, it, it, it will be reliant on the government of the day. That's why we need to attain socialism in our lifetime. Socialism is essentially going to give us free education in the truest sense of the word. Comrades and friends, uh, let me conclude here. 
Uh, I look forward to your comments, discussions. There are many other decolonial scholars whose names I have not mentioned here, whom I study and read locally, young. Uh, I can name drop if I want to, but I won't. So I, I thank them. Let us continue reading, writing, thinking, and uh, protesting. Thank you.